a warm welcome to Future Talk 2020 live here in Bern, Switzerland. And also a warm welcome to all the distinguished guests watching us online from wherever you are in the world right now. We say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Yeah, the focus of our event, of our future talk in 2020, is the impact by education in the era of the new normal. We listen, we learn, we share. We support the sustainable development and the decade of action. We are action. My name is Dorothy Gelmer. I'm your host and moderator, and I'm looking forward to three fantastic days together with all of you. Yeah, in this very special year, our future talk was arranged as a hybrid dialogue event where our panelists, our experts, are joining us on site here in Bern or via video call from all over the world. We have an action-packed program set up for today, tomorrow, and also for Friday. And for sure, we also have prepared a safety concept for all our guests here in Bern. For all of you taking part virtually on our event, we have prepared the hashtag FutureTalk2020. Please leave your comments, your statements by using this hashtag on social media and so on. And also, this is an interactive event. We want interaction with all of you. For example, you can use the comment function on YouTube to post your statements, your questions, and also our event app, which you can download on our website, futuretalk.org. And there you have the opportunity to post questions and statements, and I will hand some of them over to our panelists after the panel discussions. And we also have prepared a poll, which is on the one hand fun, and on the other hand, you can check your knowledge. We will reveal the questions today in the afternoon. Yeah, let's, let's now start with the welcoming words, the opening of Future Talk. Let's begin with the association's president of WorldTidak, Dr. Stephen McKee. Good day to all of our participants from around the world and welcome to Future Talk. I'm Dr. Stephen McKee, the president of World Didact, and on behalf of World Didact, I would like to welcome you to this special hybrid digital edition of Future Talk. I would like to thank our supporters, the government of Switzerland, our embassy hosts from Finland, Canada, Korea, the Mayor of Bern, and of course our topic sponsors from the UN agencies, UNESCO, UNIVOC, UNIDO, UNESCO UIL. As you may know, Future Talk is one of our recent initiatives to stimulate global dialogue about educational issues. This is the third edition and is normally held live at our biannual event in Switzerland, which also includes a large exhibition. Due to the COVID pandemic, we've had to postpone the exhibition till next year, and perhaps we will see you there. But this year, we want to bring you Future Talk to our audience so that they could benefit from the dialogue during these times. As the situation has become worse recently in Europe, we've had to shift more towards a digital environment for this conference, and many of our speakers will be joining us from their countries online. This is part of what we're all facing during this time, and we must all adapt. We have to face the challenges brought about by the current crisis, but we also need to plan for the future. During these times, it is important to keep the dialogue going, to continue to have input, to discuss, to share, to network, and exchange ideas. Therefore, we felt it was our duty to continue with the conference agenda this year. The world has reached a major crossroads during 2020. It is changing, and so is education. This is perhaps the most challenging time in most people's lives and their careers. Change is happening that is both good and bad. Over a billion children have been affected by school closures and slowdowns worldwide. The fallout of this may be with us for many years due to loss of learning, loss of opportunities, and also delays in advancement. Major shifts are happening in the working population, with massive job losses and the collapse of certain types of industries such as the travel and hospitality sector. Many of those job losses may be permanent, and that will leave large numbers of people unemployed and needing to be reskilled and reemployed for other industries. These are our challenges in education today and for tomorrow. 
This has motivated the world in seeking new solutions that might provide a more robust education system that can be more flexible during times of crisis. I encourage our members and viewers that this is the time to support global education in any way that you can. And this is a period also to show kindness and compassion. It is time to stay engaged, to seek solution, and find ways forward together. The World Didact Future Talk is a forum for educational practitioners and the educational industry to come together to share thoughts and ideas, discuss challenges, and find solutions to those challenges. We learn from each other, and we think and explore together, and we generate new approaches together. This can help solve the problems that we're facing. The attitude and needs of education educators now seem to be changing more rapidly than ever before. Digital learning may finally be gaining wider acceptance to become a new pillar of education that has the potential to streamline and accelerate development. We need to adapt solutions and ideas to match local needs, local conditions, and local aspirations. To do this effectively takes a wide community of educational practitioners, educational developers, and educational manufacturers, advisors, as well as financial supporters. Not just from one part of the world, but from the entire world. It takes an international community of concerned individuals, companies, and governmental organizations to do this. If we can harness the energy of these groups, visionaries, practitioners, and enablers, we can accelerate and find amazing solutions together. During this week's event, you'll be treated to a wonderful lineup of experts on a series of topics. We have three themes this year. The first is on STEM or STEAM, the second is on greening of education, and the third is on AI or Industry 4.0 combined with digital learning. Each half-day session has a UN sponsor and also a host from World IDAC. These themes are not only relevant to pre-COVID times, but are truly relevant during the current crisis and afterwards as well. Future Talk is part of the new vision of World IDAC. It is where education comes together to discuss issues and challenges and to find solutions to these problems, not just a dialogue about them. Development does not happen by accident. It takes planning, collaboration, cooperation, implementation, and dedication to manage the process. During this event, you can use the WOVA app to interact and network with the key participants. We are planning to continue to hold international online education events several times during the next year, so stay tuned to the World Didact website for further notices. One such event that we are considering to host is a special edition on digital and online learning, which is a topic that we need to discuss more about because it is a growing area of importance to the world. World Didact's new vision is to connect organizations, companies, and experts to encourage dialogue, partnership, and initiatives to advance educational development and promote innovation. Our motto is World IDAC, where education comes together. So I invite you to come and join us. Make this possible and let's expand our global network together. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me or any of the other staff or council members on the WOVA app. That is what it is for. So I hope you enjoy the conference that each of you finds something useful to take back with you and to stimulate your thoughts. Thank you very much and welcome to Future Talk. Thanks so much for the warm welcoming words and as Dr. McKee says, together is the most important thing. Thank you for tuning in from Indonesia, by the way. I have the great honor to hand over to our patron of Future Talk 2020, the Swiss government, represented uh, by the State Secretary Martina Hirayama for the official opening of Future Talk 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and honored to have been asked to open World Didact Future Talk 2020. Federal Councillor Guy Pamela, Switzerland's Minister for Economic Affairs, Education and Research, has asked me to wish you all the very best for this event and also to urge you not to be disheartened by the difficult conditions under which large-scale events have to be held this year. As the great Swiss writer Max Frisch said, crisis is a productive state, you just have to take the note of catastrophe out of it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's good reason why Federal Councillor Pamela is now the patron of your Bird Duck Future Talk. 
Education is a huge issue in our small country. This is evidenced by the generous investment made by the federal government and cantons in education, research and innovation. After social welfare, this is the second largest area of expenditure by the Swiss state. Switzerland is also aware of the fact that education has a huge international dimension. This begins with language skills, which we require in order to exist and thrive in the globalized world of work. Next comes the question of how best to address challenges that overwhelm even the potential of larger nations. Here I'm thinking in particular of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, we are conscious of the growing importance of international cooperation when addressing issues related to our education system. COVID-19 has clearly shown that countries all over the world are, to a large extent, all in the same boat. In early spring this year, it was inconceivable that educational establishments at all educational levels would have to close overnight and remain closed for months in nationwide lockdowns. So no one has a tried and tested recipe to hand for ensuring that learners can get the education they need under these conditions. In Switzerland, our educational institutions have for the large part faced this challenge successfully, but they have done so out of pure necessity. I do not exaggerate when I say that within just a few weeks, the virus has led to a bottom-up trial and error reform of the educational system that is more radical than any achieved by years of discussion on the use of digital aids in modern teaching. The experience gained teaching and learning during lockdown now needs to be applied and developed. Switzerland believes that the future lies in blended learning, but we must ensure that all learners benefit from this approach. And I mean all in a global sense. In light of all this, we believe that the following topics need to be urgently discussed, both domestically and in an international context. First, open and secure access to digital learning and educational infrastructures and content. Second, innovative teaching ideas for blended learning. Third, systematic recognition of qualifications and learning in view of the increasingly individual nature of educational pathways. Fourth, the importance of lifelong learning to ensure people are able to adapt to the constant changes in their daily lives and in the world of work. Switzerland is willing to help in the search for solutions to these issues. At the same time, it relies on best practices from all over the world. But working together in partnership, we can all make a valuable contribution to sustainable and integrative education. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that Birdidac's Future Talk 2020 will be a huge success. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, State Secretary. Thank you very much for your warm, welcoming words, your kind and encouraging words. We go on with our next point on the agenda. Let's go right away to the welcome address of the CEO of World Didact, Mr. Danny Gauch, for diving together with us into the world of STEAM education. And here he is, Danny, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Joseph Whitmer, Whitmer, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen, educators and education enthusiasts alike. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this valuable edition of Future Talk. The year 2020 has proven to be a test for all. However, I personally believe that education underwent the most drastic test. Digital transformation from practically zero to now within a weekend in most cases. Personally, I believe that everyone has mastered this exercise quite well, and I see this as a true starting point for learning 4.0, just to quote a current industrial buzzword. When we had started planning this event, no one even dared to believe that we would be held for ransom by a global pandemic. I am of the impression, however, that the world needed this situation to come 
to realize that nothing is as constant as change and that we must remain agile and informed to be able to adapt, to adapt accordingly. World EDAC is very proud to have such a variety of speakers from the Swiss government, international UN organizations, private sector, and ed tech companies who are here over the next three days to provide you with their insights and experiences. I'm also very happy to know of the educators who are joining us online and hopefully we will make use of this conference to interact with the speakers and other guests so that during the three days, education is clearly at the center of attraction, which to me confirms that World Didact truly is where education comes together. I would like to now wish you all very interesting and informative days ahead. Thank you very much. Danny Gauch, thank you very much for the welcoming words. We also look forward to great talks, panels, keynotes, and so on. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, the Deputy Director of the State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation, Mr. Josef Wittmer. Hello. This is your stage. Excellencies, distinguished speakers and members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, assembled here or attending the event from anywhere else in the world. I have the great honor of presenting the first session of the World Didact Future Talk 2020 conference as a representative of the Swiss Confederation. I wish you a warm welcome today and hope that we will all benefit from fruitful discussions and the relevant exchange of experience. The basic situation is clear to all of us. Education is one of the central prerequisites for us to continue to have sustainable livelihoods in the future. An education that is geared to issues of our time focuses on the important task of enabling individuals to develop personally in society and to integrate and remain in the labor market. Education, Mark Twain once said, is what is left over when the last dollar is gone. Let us therefore take education seriously and constantly realign education, the concept of education and education curricula with the current and future challenges faced by individuals and society. With this in mind, education today undoubtedly plays a vital role in mathematics, engineering, the natural sciences and technology. We are living in a day and age largely characterized by technological innovations. Digitalization is transforming society and the economy on a global scale. This is why STEM is a major issue in nearly every country worldwide. We are all in the same boat, as it were. International exchange and cooperation on STEM are therefore important. We are also aware of the importance of art that turns STEM into STEAM. The internationally renowned École Cantonale d'Art de Lausanne, ECAL, is working together with the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, EPFL, to promote innovation where, where technology, design, and architecture come together. ECAL and EPFL combine artistic creativity with scientific findings to find new solutions to the challenges of digital transformation. In Switzerland, we have been taking specific action for some time now to promote education in the STEM subjects. Research has shown that young people's interest in STEM subjects is determined early on, in some cases already at preschool age. That is why we pay special attention to sensitizing and motivating children and young people for these special fields. For example, we promote museums where technology can be experienced in interactive displays, develop teaching materials focused on STEM subjects, 
and organize information events about higher education institutions and STEM professional organizations at primary and secondary schools. And last but not least, we provide teachers with practical training to teach STEM subjects at all levels of education. We also give special consideration to increasing interest among girls and young women in STEM subjects, especially since in comparison with other countries, in Switzerland, women remain underrepresented in the STEM sector. Despite all this, it's not always easy to establish a correlation between promotion measures and their impact since the increasingly packed curricula make longitudinal studies a demanding and complex task. We can nonetheless draw the following conclusions. According to the latest PISA data, 15-year-olds in Switzerland are on track in mathematics. We are in fifth place behind Singapore, South Korea, the Netherlands and Japan. For higher education institutions, Switzerland has recently recorded remarkable growth in the number of students studying STEM subjects, resulting in an above average increase of 25%. In comparison, the increase in non-STEM subjects is only 8%. Only time will tell to what extent this welcome trend will continue. What is clear is that interest and competence in STEM subjects will continue to require specific support in the future. Switzerland will, for example, make computer training a mandatory component in the mathematics, informatics, and natural sciences field of study from 20, uh, 2022. Our aim is not, of course, to end up with only programmers and software engineers. A sustainable society and economy requires a wide range of specialists not least including those specialized in the humanities and social sciences. However, in a world in which nearly everything revolves around bits, bytes and algorithms, having at least basic computer skills certainly can't hurt. Allow me to conclude with a little anecdote which so, uh, shows that even in an increasingly digitalized world, a balanced and broad education remains necessary. In Seri, we have long been fostering a dialogue between representatives of traditional education and new techno technology players active in the area of education, including Google, Microsoft, etc., etc. At one event, we asked technology experts what young people should be learning these days in order to be able to cope with the future challenges of a digital world. Their response, which took us by surprise, was philosophy and ethics. In this sense, we should bear in mind that success in a digital world does not only depend on digital literacy, but also requires an education in soft skills such as creativity, curiosity, or a sense of responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Wittmer, for the insights and for your support and for joining us here live in Bern. And now I say welcome to the Ambassador Embassy of Canada in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, Mrs. Kristen Ambler, which is joining us via video call. Hello, bonjour, grüße miteinander. I'm Kristen Ambler, Head of Political and Cultural Affairs at the Embassy of Canada to Switzerland. On behalf of the Ambassador of Canada, Her Excellency Susan Vincoletto and World Didac, it is an honor to welcome you to the Future Talk Conference. We are so pleased that Canada was chosen to host this event, and we would like to thank Danny Goff, World Didac's Director General, for nominating us for this honor. I'd also like to recognize all of you, the participants in today's events, who are engaged in the important work of improving international education. More than ever, in these challenging 
and quickly evolving times, your work is vital. Canada is today's host because we are recognized worldwide for our outstanding quality of education, from elementary to post-secondary studies in both private and public settings. Education is highly valued in Canada, and our government recognizes that high quality, inclusive education is an essential element for Canada's long-term success. In fact, at 6% of our GDP, Canada spends more on education than the OECD average. Canada's public education system is not only well-funded, but of very high caliber. The federal government ensures that education, which is managed provincially, adheres to a national standard that is consistently high across the country. We are very proud that 10% of Canadian universities rank among the global top 200, and five Canadian MBA schools are in the top 100. International students from around the world are paying attention and are choosing Canada in unprecedented numbers. Canada's international student population has in fact tripled over the past decade. Last year alone, we welcomed over 640,000 international students. This growth has moved Canada into third place globally behind the US and Australia in terms of international student population. For CIS students studying abroad, Canada ranks fourth in their choice of destinations. And of course, we are working hard to move up in this ranking as well. Virtual education at Canadian institutions is also growing in popularity and opening up new possibilities for an international education in a world constrained by the COVID-19 pandemic. International students bring valuable skills and new ideas that contribute toward our excellence and ability to innovate. And Canada's ability to welcome these students has contributed to our reputation for leading edge research and innovation at Canada's institutions of higher learning. Today, we are so pleased to welcome Canadian speaker, Denise Amiel, President and CEO of Colleges and Institutes Canada, who will share with us her expertise and knowledge on these topics and more at the Future Talk Conference panel discussion at 2.15. Denise is eager to engage with you to answer questions and discuss how we can adapt international education and skills development to meet our society's future complex needs. I hope that you will take full advantage of this opportunity to meet with Denise during this conference. Thank you for being here, and I wish you an inspiring and impactful Future Talk conference today. Thank you. It's time for our first keynote then, ladies and gentlemen. Our expert is Deputy Director at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, who also leads the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. We look forward to the keynote presentation of Raul Valdez Cotera. Hello, everyone. Today, I will explain how to adapt a lifelong learning approach to innovative education, including science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Lifelong learning is a concept that most probably sounds familiar to all of you, as it has been part of the education and employment discourse, at least in Europe, for the last 30 years, but also present in the practice of countries all over the world, making clear that we learn from the cradle to the grave. This very simple concept brings us to the idea that people of all ages can learn whatever they want in an increasing wide variety of ways. More than ever, we are aware of the importance of learning. It doesn't matter where, when, how, what, and with whom. And particularly evident that lifelong learning fosters capacity to deal with change for the future we want. This has been clearly seen uh, in the rapid advances of technology and more recently in COVID-19 pandemic where we can witness how with the interruption of schools, learning in family, uh, digital technology and informal learning have been the regular practices. And also realize that learning is essentially a social process. Learning as a collective endeavor is deeply rooted in all cultures and is evident in the families, communities, circle and friends. This collective dimension puts renewed emphasis on face-to-face -face learning, particularly in public spaces, but at the same time it acknowledges the potential of new technologies. This learning is about becoming global citizenship who care about each other, other communities, and the planet. 
Among all learning so social dimensions, cities are favorable settings for promoting lifelong learning for all because of the proximity with people. The concept of learning cities is a people-centered and learning-focused approach which provides a collaborative, action-oriented framework for working in the diverse challenges that cities are facing. On this basis, the UNESCO Global Network of Learning City was launched in 2013 with the aim of providing inspiration, know-how, and best practice on how lifelong learning can become a reality at local level. There are good examples of cities among the network that by reinforcing the people center and learning focused approach, link education with other sectors such as culture, health, work, environmental issues, and engaging a wide range of partners such as the private sector, civil society, organizations, academia, etc. In the last months, the learning city members had worked hand in hand to share their solutions not only providing learning during the pandemic, but also overcoming the crisis itself. More than 25 webinars have been organized with cities together with experts to exchange ideas on contingency plans and measures taken. When addressing the topic of STEAM, some important lessons came up that I would like to share with you today. We need to make a change to the culture and institutional environment that promotes stereotypes about what we shall participate and who can excel in STEAM fields, that inclusive learning environments can welcome intellectual diversity of knowledge and thought. With the limit of time for today's presentation, I would like to suggest four key aspects which are interconnected for developing and cultivating such a learning social environment. Number one, it's very important to organize virtual learning communities that involve all stakeholders to demonstrate the relevance and value of STEAM in everyday life. Develop virtual learning communities that involve schools, parents, community organizations, non-formal learning institutions, including museums and libraries to provide consistent exposure of STEAM. Teachers, educators, and parents can take the role of mentors to encourage learners to learn about the world around them. These formal and informal educators harness perhaps one of the greatest assets in transforming st STEAM education, children's curiosity. And it's with all aspects of education, the entire community plays a critical role in demonstrating the relevance, promoting exposure and equitable access to high quality STEAM learning experiences. The engagement of the full range of stakeholders and community members in improving STEAM education in particular contexts can help mitigate the behavioral structure and organizational factors that affect STEAM teaching and learning. Practices that play a role in engaging or turning certain groups of learners away from STEAM pathways. Number two, to make a good use of informal and non-formal learning settings to enable hands-on investigation and experience of failure. STEAM education in formal schooling settings does not consistently promote some of the core values and practices of science and engineering practice, namely searching for uncertainty, recognizing ambiguity, and learning from failure. In reflecting of what STEAM education should encourage, Renowned researchers in this field describe a process of wonder and discovery, playful hands-on, investigation, learning from failure, and an enterprise that allows youth to marry their convictions and enthusiasm with opportunities to grow. In that sense, integrating STEAM content into experiences uh, that invite play, thinkering, discovery, and risk. Number three, providing learning opportunities to solve real problems and promoting an interdisciplinary approach. The complex and interlinked challenges humanity is facing today cannot be solved by single disciplines or within particular sectors. They require the bringing together of collective intelligence from different fields and stakeholders, including researchers, policymakers, entrepreneurs, educators, and learners. Learning processes must go beyond disciplinary and sectorial boundaries. 
transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary and intersectorial collaboration should include joint research as well as a practical implementation of innovative learning. Interdisciplinary approaches to teaching and learning that appropriately and effectively integrate and show connections among key concepts and ideas between different disciplines, helping students establishing a systemic way of learning and thinking. And the last one, number four, utilizing the power of technologies and makes STEAM education flexible and inclusive. Technology-enabled tools can support students gain content and technical knowledge through online videos outside the school day to prepare them for more active applied learning of the content and expand their access to authentic and interdisciplinary STEAM learning experiences. This can facilitate student-centered instruction and support students' retention of information, engagement skills, and learning outcomes. These tools uh, can facilitate a learning ecosystem that enables deeper learning in STEAM. They can bring the world into the classroom and the classroom to the outside world, contributing to create inclusive, flexible, and high-quality STEAM learning experiences. As a conclusion, I will say that all members of the community feel involved and um, should feel involved and empowered to participate in STEAM teaching and learning. That STEAM is not perceived as something that is imposed or is outside the scope of people, but is culturally appealing and relevant. That the components of the vision and the propagation of innovation practices effectively co connect STEAM with the broader agendas of people's interest and their everyday life. The joy of making STEAM an experience of a lifetime would undoubtedly help us make the planet a better place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Valdez Cotera. Yeah, the gentleman we will now hear about is, let's say, a professional all-rounder. He is a futurist, a humanist, a philosopher, a musician and an early internet entrepreneur. I'm looking forward to his speech, to his keynote. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Mr. Gerd Leonhardt. Hi, this is Gerd Leonhardt, futurist and humanist in Zurich. Uh, really great pleasure to be with you today for all three days of the Future Talk Forum in Bern in Switzerland. Uh, albeit, of course, I'll be there remotely with you. But uh, I'll kick this off with the first session uh, that's going to be about uh, education and future foresights on uh, this what's called STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, and I will have two other juicy topics for you tomorrow. Let's start right here and by analyzing what's happening right now, it's really quite clear. We're in a period of great transformation and disruption and also of hardship, I think, with the COVID crisis, economic, personal, social hardship. But we're now transitioning into a new world where things that used to be on top have landed at the bottom, like flying, like cruise ships, oil and gas, and Bitcoin, and you know all the practical things of a developed industrial society. Now we have new things on the top, technology, healthcare, working from home, uh, the whole discussion about how we're going to live in a sustainable world, and who does what, and, and uh, uh, Globalization and government, it's all new topics. There's a new narrative forming, and I call this the Great Transformation, which is a huge chance for us to reset. Some people talk about the Great Reset, the World Economic Forum does, and, and many other people have other terms for it, but here's an interesting cover design from uh, Time Magazine, also talking about the Great Reset. That is the time that's happening right now, and so next year should be really quite exciting if of course, still very difficult. We're not going to head out of the corona crisis anytime soon next year, maybe at the end of next year if we're lucky. We're living in a world that is not returning to normal. Whatever you thought about normal, uh, I thought you know normal wasn't good enough, but we're not going back there. We're not going back to a place where we travel as usual, we burn fossil fuel as usual, we have the same jobs, we work from the office. That is being rethought in every country around the world. Here in Switzerland, things are a little bit different and we are often slower in responding to this, but yeah, we're not going back to normal. We're going to a set of new normals. We're going into a world that is essentially warp drive into the future. 
And when you think about it, education and vocational training and what we have to learn in this world, basically the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. And this is not an overstatement. And we're essentially going uh, into that future gradually, then suddenly, you know, everything's kind of going slowly like uh, cloud computing or quantum computing or the Internet of Things or technology, and boom, it's there. Right? All of a sudden, we have a legal music service, several of them, and music is in the cloud. That took 10 years. So gradually, then suddenly, it's borrowed from a Hemingway novel, of course. But basically, what we see here is the pandemic is a great accelerator of the things that were already there before. If there was inequality, we have more of it now. If there was political distrust, we have more of it now. If, if there's good things like working from home, uh, doing remote teaching, remote learning, learning in the cloud, that is exploding. So I'm going to show you a couple of those key trends, very important, I think, when we talk about education and the future to look at this. Online learning and training is exploding, and that's going to take a huge boost from virtual reality, from augmented reality, holograms. But having said that, of course, everybody knows that online learning is not the same than person-to-person -person, uh, meet space, <laughs> you know, uh, real-life learning. It's, it, it's great, but it's different, and I'll talk about that later, why that is. A virtual video conference, as we do now, that is ex set to explode. Telemedicine, telehealth, yeah, people are now saying, well, maybe I don't have to go to the doctor. It may be risky, so I'm going to do a remote consultation the doctor on demand here on, on your Apple Watch, right? <laughs> E-commerce, online media is exploding. We're moving into a world where everything is all of a sudden, yeah, it, it seems like it was gradual, and now boom, is here, working from home. Right? In Switzerland, we have always worked from home quite a bit, and we have good resources, networks, mobile networks, uh, wireless networks, and so on for all of that, but it's, this is definitely also a huge challenge in our mindset. And what do we need to know to work from home? And the skills we need that in the office are really quite different than the ones we need from home. I think we're in a time of great transformation, uh, a, a time of great reset, you know, where we are essentially are, uh, as Buckminster Fuller liked to say, the great futurist, uh, at a fork in the road. Right? Uh, it is a place where we have to make sure that we take the right turn towards the sunny part of that road, not the dark part. And, and what would education for a new world look like? And how do we train our skills for that new world? The next 10 years, more changes than the previous 100 years? Well, what do we need to know? Wh what kind of skills do we need? Probably not at all the same than 10 years ago. We're living in a world that is exponentially fast uh, and also exponentially challenging. Right? It, it's not actually four, five, six, seven, eight uh, for, uh, anymore. It's, it's, it's exploding, it's doubling. An exponential curve, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, 4, 8, 16, 32, go up the scale a few times, you're at 1 billion. Right? So our kids are going to see a world that's exponentially different, right? and that change will be absolutely mind-boggling in terms of what is becoming possible, what we have to know. But it could, could also be very rewarding because we can solve global problems this way that have been there for quite some time. I often use this image of the mega shifts and the game changes. Uh, and here are the 10 game changes that we're currently seeing around us, technological game changes. Right? And I think we've seen those for a while, like 3D printing or intelligent machines or blockchain, but they're finally all coming together and creating new possibilities. I mean, if it wasn't for all this technology, the cloud, the mobile, the analytics, we probably have a lot more people in the hospital and, and even dying than we have now. I mean, this is a bad enough number, but think about what happened in World War I with the swine flu, 60 million people. And now we have the tech to coordinate and, and to make this easier. So basically what's happening all around us, this is what we have to know. What's happening with virtuality and quantum computing? And you can read more about that if you just go to uh, Game Changes on Google and put in my name. You'll see. But basically what's happening here is really quite simple, is that technology is no longer just exponential, it's also com converging the industries right? and creating combinatorial results. So for example, many companies are now experiencing that they are becoming tech companies, right? the biotechnology companies, for example, genetic engineering uh, and e-commerce. Everybody, everything is around technology now. And education is going the same path. There's going to be a huge amount of investment in technology, huge possibilities of new sources but it comes down still to one thing, you know, humans learn best with and other, other humans. 
uh, through engagement and experiences. And that's going to remain, I think, the cornerstone of education and training in the future. Apart from those three things that we see all around us, yeah, everything is in the cloud, our movies, our books, uh, everything else. Everything is becoming intelligent, so-called, but I think that word is actually quite bad. It's more like yeah, becoming smart rather than intelligent. Right? But if we set this aside for a minute, what is happening on top of this is this kind of convergence of humans and machines. Uh, as we look around us, it's quite clear that, you know, every day there's more technology to support us and to help us and sometimes also to affect us and to infect us, so to speak, like social networks uh, or gaming or virtual reality. Now we have to ask a question, what does it mean all for education? And what does it mean for what we have to learn, what skills we have? It's quite clear that computers are getting quite skillful, not in any human sense, <laughs> but the routine is probably going to be done by machines, you know, any routine really, as long as it's understandable by machines, for example, a call center or researching, or filing, connecting. You know, we're already using lots and lots of tools that are kind of intelligent, uh, kind of for the most part. So I think it's safe to say my favorite movie, Blade Runner, uh, has set forth, you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> well, the first one, right? Science fiction is becoming science fact. And and I think I have observed that all around me, wherever you look, science fiction that used to be, you know, kind of theoretically possible but not happening is all around us. For example, now we are speaking to computers and they understand us. Not very well yet, but I mean, you could see where this is going. In five years, you can speak to your machine and ask any question. Uh, and, and it won't even be a machine. It could just be your wristwatch or the wall. Right? And you can get pretty smart answers. You can probably sit at home and enjoy the internet delivering everything to you. I call this a sofa larity, kind of like the singularity. <laughs> uh, you can do uh, 3D printing of many, many objects, including shoes and electric devices, electronic devices, and of course, body parts like kneecaps and earlobes. And that's already here, but just give it 10 years and we'll see what that future will bring. And of course, machines are now becoming intelligent and they're becoming also uh, uh, a system to us. So telemedicine, being able to have remote diagnostics could reduce hospital visits by 80% if used correctly. And this is clearly the way that Apple is going and others. And last but not least, machines are learning. Are they learning like us? No. Uh, but they, they can certainly look at a lot of patterns. IBM Watson's AI can read basically, uh, I think, one million books in, a, in two minutes and, uh, and store all this information that humans can machine learning, deep learning, and language understanding. Right? I mean, imagine what that means when the computer can speak to you and actually understand when you speak like with a person, which is not quite there, but soon will be. And um, we're going to see stuff like this as a great uh, project by Waverly Labs. It's a translation device that I just- How did last night's assignment go? كيف ذهبت مهمة الليالي الماضية؟ كان جيدا. كان هناك مشكلة واحد لا نستطيع الحصول عليه. It was all right, but there was one problem I didn't get. I think this device is still in demo stages, but clearly you could see that, yeah, once we have that, um, think about education. I mean, you can speak in 30 languages or, or receive information in, in 30 languages and send WhatsApps in 50 languages in real time. Or you can use Facebook's uh, so-called infinite office, which allows you to uh, dive into the virtual world. Right? and understand what's happening there, like Tom Cruise and Minority Report. Imagine if we had that now. Yeah, it could be heaven, it could be hell, but think about the impact on education and learning and development of this. It could be too good to be true in many ways. And so we're heading into the future where what I call the mega shifts in my first book, my recent book, uh, is becoming even more important. And these are not just technology, they're also social shifts, and, and they're like a matrix of things that are interacting all the time. And if we look at those there, uh, you can ha have a look at the website, megashifts.digital, where you can download the whole chapter, uh, all, all in like 12 languages. But it's interactively uh, uh, impacting each other. So we have augmentation, we have robotization, we have cognification uh, systems becoming smart. We have uh, machines that understand other machines and can find patterns and do things that used to be humans doing this kind of work, which is probably not still on the lower level of cognitive work, but of course automation will be much bigger change than globalization has ever been. 
Uh, and this map of changes, now virtualization, what technology does is going to be mind-boggling uh, in terms of what it can do for us and which way we can go. So I think the mega shifts are going to impact all of the sciences and engineering and math, but they will also push us toward, towards a world that's about hacky, right? Humanity, ethics, creativity, and imagination, because machines will be, do be able to do so much more wo logical work. And we're going to be in an entirely different world that's uh, kind of not uh, to get too traditional here with the brain halves, but it's not going to be just about IQ and smartness. It's going to be about EQ, right? The human factor, the emotional quotient, and emotional intelligence. And that just means basically being human uh, and having compassion. And how do you develop that? You know, can you go to school for this? Can you get an MBA in emotions? And so I think our future holds that STEM will still be very important. It's all about technology. But on the other hand, the humanities are coming back. Huh? Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. I'll call that hecky as an abbreviation as opposed to STEM. So those two things will be balanced very much in our future. And we're going to see a huge momentum uh, on the curriculum in schools to go back to this, but also in companies to have training for uh, curiosity, and training for imagination, training for intuition. And you can see in this uh, amazing chart here from the World Economic Forum, the future of jobs, what we see here is that companies are looking to accelerate digitization and remote work opportunities and automation. Clearly, it's all about tech. Uh, and amazingly, you know, we, we, we see quite a few people who want to reassign workers, but not too many that want to basically completely decrease the workforce, if you're being honest. But, you know, businesses have to adopt, and this is where we're going, and that's going to force us to be better humans and have better skills in the future. That's clearly going to be a very, very big change. I always say that the future is not an extension of the present or the past. The future is, is new. Right? And whatever has worked until now, great. Will that work in the future? Unlikely. The music business does not sell CDs anymore, even though they, they still do, right? But you may have still bought one. <laughs> but it's in the cloud. It's different. The future is not the same than the past. It's an extension of the future coming backwards. So very important for us to realize in our, in our, in our training and our future skills, what we teach our kids or our employees, uh, we have to teach them the future. We have to teach them what they may need tomorrow. And in the sort of upside down world that we're clearly seeing here, these waves are all over us, right? First the COVID wave, challenging us, challenging our existence, our survival, then climate change, which is the next thing, and of course after that, a new economic logic. How would you understand this? Well, you have to have what I call a future mindset right? and get ready to educate yourself on the future. So this wraps up my first session, and tomorrow I'll be back and I'll talk about uh, green futures, and what that means for education, and of course the next day with yet another one. Thanks very much for tuning in, and I'll see you tomorrow. Wow. Mr. Leonard, thank you for the food for thought. This was an impressive presentation, and what a great presentation in the back. I'm thrilled. <laughs> I love that. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a short break, only some minutes for changing the setting here. And in the meantime, you can check our website, futuretalk.org, for getting all the information about our speakers, uh, insights, and many more. You can also find the agenda, and maybe you want to have a look what happens tomorrow or this afternoon. We will be back in some seconds. And if you want to share your thoughts, and um, please use the hashtag futuretalk2020. See you in some minutes. Stay tuned and don't go anywhere. Wir sind schon drauf. <laughs> We're there already. I didn't see the, the sign. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, after a short break to Future Talk 2020. Some of our guests got a coffee or a new drink, and uh, hopefully you too at home or at the home office. As you see, I have a guest here, and I'm looking forward to a talk with Peter Ziswiller, Head Corporate HR at Georg Fischer AG. Hello, Hi, Mr. Sorry, Ziswiller. Good to have you here. Thank you. So, Georg Fischer AG. Why is learning such a focus in this company, in your company? Um, we are a Swiss industrial organization acting on a global level. And um, having about uh, 30 to 40 percent of our value adding in Switzerland and only about 4 percent of the turnover in Switzerland. And being confronted with the fact that um, 
we have a constant appreciation of the Swiss franc. So basically our products become more and more expensive. Mm -hmm. Even if we digitalize, if we automize, if we um, improve our processes, etc. So what we can distinct, what, can us, what makes us distinctively different and where we can achieve an, an competitive advantage, uh, particularly uh, against uh, our competitors uh, coming from Asia, for instance, mm -hmm. Uh, is is by uh, evolving into a, a specific culture, meaning as well a learning culture. Mm -hmm. uh, if our people collaborate, if our people know um, uh, what they can do best for the organization, if they are on top of issues, if they are aware about the modern technology and forms uh, on working together, I think we can, we can have and establish a competitive advantage. Um, that is not easy to copy. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this learning culture. How does this learning culture yeah, really look like at Georg Fischer AG? I think, uh, first of all, it is important that we do not train and educate only a specific group. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do not limit that to age or particularly and certainly not to, to any gender or anything. So everybody is invited to join in any kinds of trainings. So there is some basic trainings about the organization that you need to know, but then we come easily into culture elements like, uh, for instance, we train on the seven habits and how we collaborate. But the learning culture as such is established as well, accepting that something at times does not go mm -hmm. well. So um, a learning culture is one of the core elements for us, particularly being in an environment of industry and engineers, the acceptance, the acceptance of something not going the way it should have gone or mm -hmm. it would have been expect, expected. Mm -hmm. So if people can openly address and openly admit that uh, something didn't go well, uh, that obviously intelligent failures, hopefully, um, that opens as well the aspiration of trying different and new things, mm -hmm. as well as learning with different methods or approaching an issue on a different new path rather than maybe on a traditional one, maybe achieving in this way a result much faster, but as well, this is a high risk. And then uh, it is important that if people fail, uh, that they accept that uh, failure easily and, and quickly. So. We have the saying within the organization coming from the design thinking, um, fail fast to succeed early. Mm -hmm. That's a very human way of thinking because um, making mistakes is, is human, it's normal. Yeah. And we have to cope with this. Um, practical experience is very important for, for young people to get into the flow, to get into yeah, what's happening in the, in the, in the future. Why is um, apprenticeship so important? for you and your company? Um, apprenticeship is important in two ways. One way is certainly we have a large group of people which are simply maybe not tuned to, to go for a demanding university curriculum, mm -hmm. which have maybe more interest in, in practical work and, and maybe not that much in theory. Many of these young people uh, going into apprenticeship over time then aspire to go deeper into the issues and maybe attend an, an, an university of applied science in a, in a continuous path. But the, the apprenticeship, I believe, is so ex uh, successful because people are acting, are working on practical elements. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we talk STEM or STEAM, yeah. that is in a shop that people can really actively do and try uh, new things, or uh, they are doing practical pieces, or they are part of a process, and they are working together with more experienced people, so they learn a lot while doing. Mm -hmm. And then that is in Switzerland combined as well with schooling. Uh, by the way, it's as well in Germany and Austria where we have uh, a similar concept. And it's interesting if you observe on a, on a global level that Switzerland, Germany and Austria as well, compared to many other countries, have a relatively low unemployment rate among young people and I strongly believe that this is in the sense of the apprenticeship because apprentices can be involved immediately into active and practical work in the organization. Mm -hmm. 
as we talk about Georg Fischer AG, people say um, your company has a very people-oriented culture. Um, isn't this in conflict with the demands of business or the professional performance? Um, I don't think so, no. Good. <laughs> I think, <in> f <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, they are adjacent. I think one cannot be excluded uh, with the other. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to, uh, people to, ha to feel safe, we talk, for instance, in the organization of the so-called psychological safety. If you want them to perform, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned before, if you talk about uh, a failure culture as well, the acceptance of failure, if they need to, if we allow people to speak up, they need to feel safe to do so. And um, I think uh, that uh, we can achieve results and as well developments quicker if we have such an open and transparent culture where people feel safe, they feel safe to speak up, to, uh, to, to as well defend another opinion, um, and, um, and, and are tuned to try new in things in different ways. Mm -hmm. Georg Fischer AG is a very uh, traditional organization established in 1802 um, already. So how can you ensure to stay abreast of the contemporary technical culture and learning attitudes and developments? Well, we are around since more than 200 years. <laughs> and I think that says as well a lot that it's not about the only the history. I think the company has to invent itself on a permanent way, meaning um, uh, you have to accept uh, sometimes that things or businesses are maybe not the same as they were in the past and you need them to evolve into new environments. And um, I think that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we are looking where are fields of the future, um, where can we with our knowledge technologies um, bring value to society and to the people um, in, on, this, on this planet. So this is a constant tuning, and that again uh, requires the openness of the organization to learn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Mr. Ciswila, thank you very much for the insights, for um, letting us in into the world of Georg Fischer. All the best to you, and thank you very much for being here thank in you. Bern with us. Thank, thank you, you, appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we have a quick, yeah, applause, thanks. <laughs> We continue with our first panel for today. I'm looking forward to meet uh, the participants. Let's talk about in the age of 4.0, how do children get exposed to STEAM education at an early age to help push national economic and social growth? This is the topic we will talk about in the next 50 minutes. And I'm very happy to welcome four specialists in this field, two here live in Bern and two via video call. I say welcome to Hans Hest, president of Swissman. Where is? There, over there. Hello, Hello Mr. Hest. Good to have you here. Hello. Thank you. Take a seat, please. Thank you. And Alexis Georgia Kopoulos, the director, University of Art and Design, Lausanne. Hello, Hello. welcome. Hello. And we are very happy to welcome also Denise Amyot, President and CEO of Colleges and Institutes in Canada, who is joining us live via Zoom. And there she is, hello, and also Mr. Chahabava, co-founder and CEO of Goodwall. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Can we hear you? Denise Amyot, President and CEO of Colleges and Institutes in Canada. I, I can hear you. Um, it seems like there might be a little lag, but I can a hear you. A bit of delay. I just heard that. Okay, but we can hear you. We can see you. That's perfect. So I think we just start with uh, the first question that I'd like to hand over to Mr. Hess. Mr. Hess, let's open the day with um, the first question. Why is STEM education so important, especially for the industry sector? Like I would say that uh, most of the big challenges for society these days, things like climate change, energy saving, mobility, uh, safe food, uh, water, uh, all these type of things actually will require new and innovative and I believe mostly technical solutions. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, then the industry who will provide the technical solutions to these applications or to these challenges, will actually need a workforce that is able to use these modern technologies 
in order to bring the world forward. And if that's true, then I think the Swiss industry w will, will, will need to make sure that, the, as has been mentioned before, uh, we are one of the most expensive places in the world. If we won't want to be competitive, we need to do something different. Mm. And I believe in addition to education, which has been mentioned before, and this lifelong learning and a learning organization, I believe the, the, the capability to be innovative, to have innovative new ideas to be applied to make these problems resolved or at least improved, I think this requires an enormous amount of talent and an enormous amount of knowledge in this STEM or STEAM capacity. Mm -hmm. And I would even take this one level up and say it's, it's not only about uh, science and technology and engineering and these type of things. It, it, also, it also is important that we, that we train people to be more curious, uh, train mm -hmm. people to, to be able to do critical thinking, to, to, to resolve complex issues, mm -hmm. um, team uh, cooperation ca and collaboration. So I think if we group all these things together, there is this uh, term of uh, 21st century skills. And I think at the end of the day, we will need to be able to train our youth on these 21st uh, um, century skills but it's not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. We will also have to train the current workforce sure. and even people like myself to actually be skillful in these 21st centuries. So that's why I believe this is very important. And once we have learned all these skills, we will need to be able to apply this. You know, all the knowledge, all the science, everything is useless in a sense mm -hmm. if it's not applied to solve people's problems. Mm -hmm. And I think this is another strength that Switzerland has. We have a lot of training and institutions that actually focus on application, uh, focus on resolving problems. And I think if that, if we can, if, if we can, uh, let's say, take this STEM education, uh, expand it to STEAM and to, to the 21st century skills and apply this quickly to solve the world's problem, then I think the Swiss industry and the global industry can make a huge contribution mm -hmm. uh, to these challenges. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mr. Giorgio Coppolos, art is in your veins. We can say that you're the director of University of Art and Design in Lausanne. Let's talk about the A in STEAM. Uh, why are arts the key component in STEAM and why is this so important for education in your perspective? Okay, my, my, my answer will be, of course, very biased, as, <laughs> you, as you just said, but I think I'm here to represent the A as much as I can. Yes, um, please. In a way, I think it's something extremely important because uh, if we look at STEM, uh, of course, it's something which has been going on for years, let's say, or a very long time, and uh, there's a lot of connection between all these. And I think that the, the art section, which is not, of course, just art in the very uh, basic sense of the word, but it includes everything which has to do with creativity, uh, in a, again, in a very, broad, very broad sense, I think it's what today can make a difference and what can connect also all the other disciplines together. Uh, and I think that in, in today's world, uh, as it was just said, it's what is going to make not just a difference, but make also uh, give a, a direction in all that which is happening right now uh, in terms of giving some, let's say, purpose on mm -hmm. all that. And also be, uh, if you look at what the younger generation also aspires to, give also some more meaning to all that, bringing more humanity, bringing more inclusiveness, uh, which is, of course, maybe not something that you would find directly in, you know, engineering or mathematics, uh, as, you know, maybe an older generation would, uh, would think. Hmm. So creativity is very important now at the moment. Maybe some people would say, okay, art is not the best thing to do now, maybe do something like technology or something like this. How would you support young people that say, oh, art is in my blood too? No, I think that it's because of art that we can, of course, uh, remain hopeful, yeah. that we can look into, you know, something w more looking into the future and uh, which I think also makes us, I hope, look at the the th brighter things in life, or at least what remains. You're right. um, uh, and I in any way, uh, I think that it's what actually gives um, maybe some more, uh, con more contemporary output or outlook in things like technology or sciences, 
uh, which maybe keeps them and makes them even more relevant than they are already. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, we can see very easily in projects which come out from uh, Cal, for example, or from any other design school today, mm. that it's not just the arts for the sake of arts. Mm. Uh, I think it's arts which embrace all the other disciplines, which uh, bring them together, which, which create or give solutions to problems, society problems, uh, human problems, uh, ecological problems, mm. and it's this maybe this je ne sais quoi, if you want, <laughs> of the artist, which actually creates something which is not uh, easy to define by um, pure uh, or very very mathematical mm. or in yeah. square yeah. Uh, calculations or diagrams. And this difference, I think, is something which every every country, I would say, should uh, work on and and. Uh, and foster in order to really make it uh, something like an additional um, strength mm -hmm. of their identity and also uh, even if we speak about identity of the industry but identity of the education uh, which I think education also has become something which many countries put uh, put f uh, up front as a as an export mm -hmm. also today uh, and I think that Switzerland has a big big role to play in that today again thank you for these insights. Mr. Bava, one question, and we have a delay. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, this will work out. I can out. hear you. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> you can hear me, that's good. How does your business leverage technology to impact society in a positive way? And how does this help young people to overcome the so-called gender gap? Right. Mr. Yeah, thank you so much. So our mission at the end of the day is to level the playing field for youth around the world, help them maximize their potential and impact society positively. We do that leveraging a mobile first technology that is accessible to everyone. And that really gives them the right experiences as well as the right opportunities at the right time. Um, the way we looked at this and the reason why we got into this business or this social enterprise rather was because we believed the reason I'm here in front of you today is, or virtually, is not because I'm necessarily smarter or harder working than most people, but, uh, but rather because I was lucky to have the experiences and the education, specifically education that happens outside of what we define as formal education. So really those experiences of being able to develop that confidence, of being able to develop resilience, of being able to develop certain experiences or, 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 or broadness of mind allows me to be where I am. And we said, if we could give those opportunities to millions of other people, well, then we're likely to not only help them maximize their potential, find the right path for them, build up their confidence, give them the right skills, but also impact society positively. Because um, a key part of what we're doing is not just about maximizing the potential of an individual. I think now more than ever, how can that individual contribute towards society when they're within the workforce with their decisions, how they go about supply, I mean, anything from, and this is a cross industry. You don't have to work for a non-for-profit to move society forward. Um, and, and when we talk about the gender gap, it, it's, the same, it's the same for all youth, but it's exasperated, uh, it's exasperated within, the, within the context of, of gender. Uh, we look at it as a funnel when we talk about experiences. You know, your first experiences start you know, with where you're born. And then when we talk about the gender gap, you know, the first cultural influences seem to come on like a day after you're born. And then it just continues. And there's a funnel of dropouts towards when we talk about gender and STEM, for example, that at least from our understanding, that happens from that day. And then, you know, there are other inflection points at the age of 16, at the age of 18 and going forward. Part of that is linked to confidence. Part of that is linked to uh, role modeling. Part of that is linked to exposure, and we emphasize that through our platform. So it's a community where you can, I give you a concrete example, a little bit anecdotal. We had a Jordanian girl who was really into robotics. Nobody around her was really into robotics. She was able to connect to, to, to students in the US. She then did an internship at NASA and is continuing her journey, right? So this is what's happening really outside of the classroom, but we gave her that opportunity um, to understand what is possible. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we connected her to that scholarship and that opportunity down the line. Um, and, and so that's really kind of how, how we do it. So it's giving them the, the opportunities at a young age, as early as possible on a global level. And you know, our approach is really 
you know, we serve millions of youth around the world and we're trying our best to make sure that, uh, you know, it's, it's not just serving high achievers um, looking to go to Ivy League schools, but really, really everyone as, as much as possible. And, um, and that's why, you know, technology is important because we just wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise. Giving them the, what the a great example. That's the way it should be. Mrs. Amiot, you just nodded and I think you agree uh, on what uh, Mr. Bava said in the last minutes. Uh, I can see it in your face. And um, thank you for joining us too, Mrs. Amiot. Um, one question I'd like to hand over to you is how encourages the Canadian Future of Skills Council the creation of green jobs for the future generations? Do you have an example for us too? Um, for, first, I want to say how I agreed with uh, what Taha was saying, and now I would like to have a side conversation with him uh, later. So your question is about uh, green skills? Yes, Sorry. green education, green jobs for future generations. Okay, so, so for us, when we talked about uh, green education, we, we talk about um, uh, the way you live, the way you study, the way you work, and the way you play. And what we try to do is to integrate, in fact, a green spirit, green skills in every single, in every single um, curriculum. Uh, we do it also with um, the facilities that we have to ensure that they are green. We ensure also that we, we work with communities to ensure that communities, in fact, uh, are educated with respect to green skills. It could be to have a community garden on the campus, in fact. It could be to have a, a garden with indigenous plants so that people uh, see that you can have different types of, uh, of, 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 of green, if you want. And we also make sure that, of course, you know, we do those recycle, reuse and all that. But what we found is that if you involve students, they are all about greening. Uh, it is the best way to engage them. And whenever there are groups uh, within the uh, institution that were looking at the greening, what is happening is that we have noticed better retention of students because they feel engaged in a good cause. So there are many reasons to, to look at green skills. It's not only from an environmental point of view, but it's also from a social point of view and a cultural point of view. Because one of the things, for example, that we try to do is to ensure that even if you teach culinary art, you think about green, you think about ensuring you use all the products. If you uh, teach uh, construction, we ensure that we, we talk about using uh, products that are good for the environment. Uh, in the uh, labs, we ensure also that students that will become lab technicians will know about this. Thank you, Mrs. Amiot, for sharing your thoughts with us. Mr. Hess, another question. Uh, when and where should STEAM education take place? I would say uh, as early as possible yeah. and everywhere. And everywhere. I would say as early as possible. Um, and that can even start, you know, I'm, I, I, I have seen my own children grow. I see now my grandchildren grow. Mm. And I can see how, how curious they are, how creative they are. And, and you can you can help them to explore the world and, and science and technology and engineering and arts and all these things which we are talking about very early on, as soon as you can start to communicate with them. But I think from an, from an empirical studies point of view, we have learned that if we do not expose, if we do, if we do not have given children, a, let's say, an initial formal exposure until the age of six years wow. to... Mm -hmm to some of these STEM-related matters, mm. in a, not in a scientific way, in a very practical, in a very day-to-day -day applied way, I think it will be difficult 
to bring them to a next level. And if they do not have a consolidated basic understanding about STEM matters at the age of 12, which is the finish of the middle school mm. in Switzerland, th then, so this is the sixth year of education. If they don't have a consolidated view of these matters, it will be very difficult to to, to, to motivate them to go into STEM-related studies and to motivate them to go into STEM-related uh, rela jobs at the, late, at, mm -hmm. at the later stage. So, and, and this is particularly challenging for girls, and I, I, I think, you know, in our industry, I have to shame on us, but we, we are a man's world, mm -hmm. and we cannot afford to be a man's world mm -hmm. anymore. We need young ladies, young children, uh, to, to come up and, and be interested in these STEM matters and, and overcome some of these prejudices. And we will need to facilitate and coach them and help them uh, in order to get there. But I would say um, primary school is certainly already an important time when you need to expose children to STEM and se certainly later on um, as well. Mm. Um, so, so I'd, I'd say um, um, we, we, uh, we think it's not, and, and, and we should not only limit this to school, you know, you can, uh, obviously formal teaching is one thing, but we need to, again, <laughs> allow these children to apply their knowledge in the real world mm. and resolve tasks together with other kids, you mm. know, and, to, and, 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 and apply this learning, which then, you know, it is a, I've learned in my own early teaching expertise that you need to, you need to learn by thinking, but then you need to repeat it, and then you need to apply it, and then you can you kind of find a way to consolidate your knowledge. And I think the same is true for STEM education. So as early on and as as broadly as possible, certainly in primary school. But then maybe also the social life plays a very important role. It means parents, grandparents. When you say it should start before the age of six, then they are at the kindergarten, they yes. are at home, they play with other other children. How can we support that? Yes, I, I think you, have, you make a very good point. I think we should not push all the responsibility to the teachers mm. in primary school or secondary school or universities. Mm. I think this is also a social Definitely. engagement. Mm. And I, have, I enjoy enormously at this point in time to play with my grandchildren and open their eyes. And you can start with engineering with Lego, you mm -hmm. know, and, and do other things. And, and they're so creative. And they're so creative <laughs> and they're so curious, you know, and I they enjoy so they enormously. <laughs> and they play together yeah. and it's, so, it's fantastic. So yeah. I, I, think, I think we maybe should also overcome this notion that teaching is only a school matter. Mm -hmm. Teaching is a daily matter. And as has been mentioned by uh, the gentleman from Georg Fischer, yeah. you know, um, we need to continue to teach. It, it, this is a lifelong learning experience, mm -hmm. and things change so rapidly. Yeah. We will learn different jobs. We will learn several jobs during our lives, and we need to relearn and learn new things and maybe unlearn old things. So I think this is a constant, ex a, a constant learning experience which should not be limited to formal school teaching. Mm -hmm. I think that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jotakopoulos, what are the possible positive impacts of STEAM for societies and future generations, in your opinion? I think it's, again, as it was previously said, I think it's an impact on society which can only go in a good way. Yeah. Um, I think to broaden up each, uh, each one's horizons is extremely important. And to also, uh, as Mr. Hess was saying, I think to, to create more curiosity mm. in a, in a, from a very early stage and to really, I would say, train people to be even more curious. I think mm -hmm. it's something which needs to be trained. Uh, curiosity is not something that you have it, of course, but then you can always um, raise it to a higher level. Uh, what, what do you think what happens that it's not raising? What, what does it stop? No, sorry, I didn't understand. What, what, what stops the curiosity of growing? Oh, uh, is, I is, think, is it you know, time? It's, it's is, it, is it the focus on, on, the, on the wrong thing? It's, it's maybe, you know, getting used to things as they always were and not, you know, like being in a routine, for example, and not questioning uh, what are you doing in your life, why you do it, mm -hmm. uh, wh why does any somebody else do that mm -hmm. the way they do it. Yeah. I think it's something which is uh, an ever, you know, uh, go going thing. And um, I think it also has a lot to do with this continuing, continuous learning, uh, especially in the arts and design fields. Uh, you know, you're never an expert of anything. Uh, you always become better, you always learn new things, and you always, let's say, strive to, to learn new things and to make yourself 
more knowledgeable than you were maybe a day earlier or a month or a year. And um, I think that also goes together with the transdisciplinarity because I think it's something which also STEAM encourages. It's not, you know, vertical silos. Each, of course, should be starting from somewhere mm. as a basic knowledge, but then can, you know, go like a zigzag through all of them or most of them uh, by taking uh, the parts which are needed. And especially, for example, in arts and design again, um, today the, the, these fields have become uh, in a way that uh, you cannot remain in a closed field. You have to go out and search for things. And I think knowledge is around, around us everywhere. And uh, I think it would be a crime to say that, okay, now I reached a point where I don't want to know any more of any other things. I think it's very important to that the schools, of course, uh, first of all, and families, of course, but basically schools learn, uh, teach people and young people to really go out and look for information. And I think it's something which uh, society needs today more than ever to be knowledgeable of not just one thing, but of many things in a constantly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions you'd like to pose to our panelists, to our speakers, please use the comment function on YouTube or in our event app, and I will hand perfectly the most of them over to our panelists at the end of our panel talk. So it's also interactive. Please use the comment function. Um, Mr. Brava, another question to you. Um, you have an educational background um, in inter international economics. How did this influence your first business and how could your advice look like in light of this for the global community? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I started my first uh, my first business um, actually before getting my uh, my university degree. So I wasn't qualified in any ways in terms of economics. I didn't know much about economics when I started my first company. Um, I think you know economics is a good base, um, and I'm and I'm lucky to have studied it. But uh, I've changed kind of my view on the importance of what you study. I, I used to think that it was super important to pick a certain a certain field. I think given the current situation of the world, which is just um, accelerating in this direction, one of the few things, if I can humbly say that we do know about the future, is that it is constantly changing. We live in a world where industries are being created and destroyed over the span of years, where skills, hard skills, are being rendered obsolete over the, over the span of years. So I think rather than saying a particular subject or university or other is important, I'd say, what I learned most of what I know through, through doing, and I've gone through continuous education. I, I, um, I, I am, I'm super um, drinking the Kool-Aid of that uh, lifelong learning journey. But I think what's, what's really important for the next generation is not, um, is not necessarily a hard skill, but rather the soft skill of being able to be resilient and being able to be adaptable. Probably the best advice I received um, when I was making my first pitches from an investor was, um, a very successful investor was, he, he said, I don't normally get it right the first time, but I tend to be very quick in getting it right, in fixing it when I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of interesting because, and it applies very well to the world of work because you might work somewhere and then all of a sudden that company has disappeared or that entire department has disappeared. And if you don't have that resilience to deal with it, and I think this next generation has just had a, a crash course in resilience because of the COVID crisis in a way that um, few have maybe experienced in the Western world over the past you know, 50, 60 years, um, th that, that is so useful for the future and so useful for the future of work. So I think that that's probably um, my advice. I, I don't know if it answers your question exactly. Um, I'm not, not to undermine econo economists, but, um, no. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but a very good advice, Mr. Brava. Thank you for that. Mrs. Amyot, it's not a secret that automation, digitalization, and labor-saving technologies are generating, but also eliminating jobs. Please give us your views on possible employment opportunities for the youth in STEAM. Okay, in, in fact, uh, STEAM is, is opening a number of jobs. Uh, it's not only opening jobs in science, in technology, but it's also opening jobs everywhere, including in arts, because you can use, in fact, technology in arts. 
You can use technology even in culinary arts nowadays. Um, and uh, what's happening is that you, you have, when you think about job, you have to think about jobs uh, are being created now. Uh, every day, there are new ways of doing things that uh, have not been envisaged before. Uh, for me, the best example is an electrician. Before, an electrician uh, didn't need so much technology per se, but nowadays, if they don't know how to function with internet, because everything is linked to uh, internet, you, you won't be able to, uh, to function. Uh, one of the things that I think is important in our discussion today uh, I know that Alexi uh, earlier talked about uh, the continuous learning. For me, one of the things that is very important is to ensure that when we talk about continuous learning, the way to push it, the way to develop curiosity is in fact by putting people of multidisciplinary team together so that they can learn from each other and they can push each other. And when you, you talk about uh, the, the jobs, it, we, we cannot leave people behind. We can, uh, because vulnerable people need to be part of those jobs, of those jobs of tomorrow. So um, education system have a responsibility, in fact, to ensure that they are part of this. And there are various ways that we can do that. I know that us in Canada, what we do with our training, we, we have wraparound services uh, to ensure that people uh, can be um, educated and have the skills required. We even do pre-technology programs. We offer uh, different introductions to different trades, for example, or different profession during a week. We, we have trucks that go in different places with different types of job in it so that people can uh, do hands-on and have experience with it. But the most important thing for me is inclusion, it's uh, upskilling also never stop uh, learning. Thank you, Ms. Samyat. There is a good question from the audience. I think I'd hand it over to you, Mr. Hess, because it's about Swiss men. It says the biggest issue facing the manufacturing sector is a war for talent. How does Swiss men support the Swiss industrial companies to remain competitive in the long term? It's uh, probably the most strategic subject, mm -hmm. I would say, that mm -hmm. I'm thinking of. Yeah. Because, you know, we have a, a demographic change, uh, which, is really a, which is really a big challenge. Um, uh, in the next five years, in my country, 100,000 skilled people will go into retirement mm. and only 25 come from youth. It's a so, problem, we have huh? a, so we'll have yeah. a, big, a big delta and a big yeah. challenge. Yeah. Um, obviously, we focus on, 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 on education, on making our industry attractive, on attracting youth, but I think we have uh, recently seen that this may not be enough to focus on youth. And, and, and we, we see uh, through digitization on one hand, but also through the structural changes that this pandemic will bring, that there will be people who will be in jobs which are not needed anymore mm -hmm. or not to the same extent. And, and the opportunity for us is how can we bring these people who may currently work in tourism mm -hmm. or work in transportation or work somewhere where it's not needed anymore because mm -hmm. it's automated, how can we bring these people who are people between 40, 50, 60 years of age, how can we bring them into, uh, into the, those jobs that we are currently lacking? Those, how can we fill the holes that, 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 we are, that are there, the 75,000 people? And we have invented a, a program which we call Mem Passerelle 4.0. It's kind of a, a bridge. Um, it's, a, it's, it's meant to be a bridge from an existing job which is no longer in demand into a new job which is in demand. 
and allow those people to cross the adult people, not young people, yeah. adult people, 30, 40, 50 year old, 60 year old people, to cross that bridge in a manner of one to maximum two years and finish this with a certification and be ready for those jobs that are in demand and, and, and make the whole labor market more flexible, more adaptable to these dramatic and fast changes ahead. Mm -hmm. And and we have just started this program. I don't mm -hmm. know where it's going, mm -hmm. but I hope this is going to make a big contribution, not only for us to win the war of talent, but also for people that do not have jobs because of digitization and pandemic and other things that may that come. come. Uh, how can we bring them back into areas where there is jobs that actually are attractive jobs with the future? So and this is lifelong learning. It's very it's much lifelong learning. School, yes, huh? yes, also yes. Also for adults. Yes. Yeah, an exciting um, topic, uh, an exciting theme that will, yeah, be important for and the next And we are very years. glad that the government in Switzerland, uh, Mr. Support. Wittmer and uh, <laughs> Rayama, they're all supporting us. So I think it should be a big thing and I really look forward to that. Great, thank you for sharing these insights. Mr. Brava, all, one more question. The industry continues to have difficulties in finding and recruiting young professionals with a STEAM background. Uh, how can Goodwall, a network which aims to connect young people with college and employment opportunities, uh, help by ag aggressing s uh, STEAM talents, accessing STEAM talents? Yeah, thanks so much. I think, um, again, coming back down to that, that element or that, that analogy of a funnel, um, when we talk about some of these industries where there are shortages, you know, we, we need to position, and a lot of work is being done, but we need to position that next, first of all, let the next generation know that the opportunities are out there, that these career paths are out there, and then make those particular career paths exciting. So we focus a lot on not just employer branding, but industry and career branding. And we do that um, by offering uh, corporates and organizations tools to be able to do that and to position themselves with the values of this next generation. So for example, here in Switzerland, we worked um, and we're working with the government on um, entrepreneurship challenges for the next generation. So uh, we call this the Swiss Futurepreneur Challenge and we, we work on helping youth develop that entrepreneurship uh, spirit, even if they don't become entrepreneurs. Um, we do know that whether it's you know the largest companies here or the smallest companies here, we do need that ability from the next generation to not just do a task, but also help sometimes reinvent some of these companies that are going through the second, third generation as well, and the larger companies that are trying to transform how they behave. So we're doing that. And then on the company side um, uh, and on the organization side, beyond employer branding, we then, when there is interest, um, we then help connect you know the right people to the right organization. So we, again, look at it not as a transaction, um, leveraging technology, we're able to look at this as more of a journey. Um, and we're able to do this in a, in, a, in a cost effective way to kind of connect the right people to the right opportunities. And one of the big challenges is, you know, most really talented people want to go to a very few select group of organizations. Um, and even those organizations may not necessarily be attracting the ones that they really want. And so when we're talking about young talents about the right fit, and that's where, you know, employer branding in particular associating with the right values, whether it be, we talked about the environment, we talked about um, you know, the inclusivity, um, and here I talked about entrepreneurship, um, is, is so important for a branding perspective. Organizations, um, and even those organizations Thank you. One more question for you, Mr. Giacopoulos. ECOL is recognized as globally for its prestige educational program and also for the partnerships with famous brands like IKEA, BMW, and so on. Can you give us an example on a case how ECO empowered students to solve environmental challenges for the private sector? Yes, I mean, it's not just for the private sector directly, first of all. It, we have also, I mean, self-initiated projects mm -hmm. which are going through the um, environmental, um, uh, let's say, uh, goals. Uh, for example, we did uh, a project right now, re very recently, which is called Aesthetics of Sustainability, mm -hmm. and actually questions, first of all, and then gives as much as possible answers to uh, different materials and different production techniques which have to do with sustainable materials. Mm -hmm. Let's say we started from the point that for many years, the sustainability and all the these new materials had more or less always a... Uh, aesthetically a very uh, clear identity 
and we wanted them not to differentiate them anymore from all the other more traditional materials, but really to give them a, a new value, an added value, uh, in terms of design and, of course, function and production techniques. So we, we involved um, a series of students and also researchers in that project, uh, which uh, took place uh, a year ago, more or less, and now it will be uh, produced uh, publicly with a book and also web website uh, presenting all these things. And all the projects are, links, are linked with companies. So it's not just we didn't invent mm -hmm. a new material. We work with existing materials, but through the perspective of design um, and also the young generation, we gave them uh, a new purpose, a new, let's say, outlook, uh, which I think will also raise a, a new awareness on, on how people, um, let's say, uh, act and, and react to these uh, materials. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, on the other side also, we have been, all the collaborations we do with, let's say, with major companies are always uh, let's say, uh, taking all the ways into, uh, into account uh, sustainability issues, uh, be it, uh, you know, appliances or uh, smaller objects, uh, everyday life objects. So it's something which I think a school and also young uh, designers uh, must always take into account. It's, it's extremely important uh, as an issue to, to raise every day. Thank you. Yeah, we already come to the end of our panel. I have one question that I'd like to hand over to all of you, only for a few sentences maybe. Um, Mr. Bava, maybe I start with you. If you had one wish for STEAM education, how would that wish look like for the future? Oh man, that's a, that's a tough one, one wish. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think just giving as much support as we can. Um, you know, there's so many different pieces. But yeah, give it like, you know, we need to come together as a society and it can't just be left to the next generation. So um, as much governmental support as we can to, to, to help, um, to help on Thank this journey. Thank you. Mrs. Amiot, your wish for STEAM education and the young generation. So my wish is access, access to STEAM. My wish is inclusion, inclusion in STEAM. And my final wish is to ensure that we introduce applied research in the college system, that we do not have applied research only in universities, uh, because I think it allows people to work together and solve real problems, real challenges. Thank you, Mrs. Amiot. Mr. Hess, how should the future of STEAM education look like if your wish would come true? Um, we would have five times more girls and ladies involved in technical and scientific jobs. And I think this is crucially important for Switzerland to, mm. really, um, to really win the war for talent and have the skilled people because if we if we remain a, a man-oriented world in our industry, we will not find the talent that we need for the future. Mm. And we will also lack the diversity that this gender diversity actually adds to, to the world. So my biggest wish is hopefully we'll be able to excite more girls and l young ladies to study um, a profession which is, uh, which is based on the STEAM education. And curiosity is the key, and creativity. Uh, Mr. Jajakopoulos, how does your wish look like? I mean, I would say all the above, but as much as possible, make the A bigger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A perfect <laughs> ending for our panel talk, in my opinion. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, Mrs. Um, Amiot, Mr. Bava, Mr. Hess, Mr. Jajakopoulos, thank you very much for giving us uh, uh, yeah, a look into your thoughts for your experiences that you shared with us in the last minutes. Thank you for being part at Future Talk 2020. Um, all the best to you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully till next year, all together in one event. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a break, a coffee break of round about 45 minutes. We go on at 3.45 with the second panel um, of today. Take the time maybe to visit our futuretalk.org website to get all information about our speakers, all information about our panelists. Um, visit the website if you want to share your thoughts and your statements 
with uh, the people on social media, please use the hashtag FutureTalk2020. We're back in around about 40 minutes. I hope you are there. See you later and stay tuned. Thank you very much.